Our guest on this episode is Richard Grove. Richard is the founder of the Tragedy and Hope website, which enables individuals to research and form groups of independent thinkers to solve humanity's most pressing problems. Before that, Richard worked as an account executive in New York City, selling enterprise software and services to the world's largest financial services companies. After discovering that his corporation was selling software with a back door, which allowed illicit transactions to take place beyond oversight, he blew the whistle, which led him into court from 2003 three to around 2007. He manages to connect his Wall Street whistleblowing experience and 9-11 along with insider trading and conspiracy and indeed has intimate first-hand knowledge of 9-11 as he was on his way to a meeting that day on the 96th floor of the World Trade Center North Tower when it came down. So Richard, you're very welcome to Alchemy Radio. It's a great pleasure to have you on. You're somebody whose work I've been closely studying and monitoring and following for quite some time and it's, it's great to have you. How are things? I'm outstanding. Things are great. And I'm a big fan of what you and Stevie do there. And uh, it's an outstanding guest list that you have on your podcast. I mean, I'm fans of almost every person that you've interviewed during the duration of your podcast. So as a fellow Podomatic podcaster, I, I take my hat off to you and salute you, sir. Well, really appreciate that. Uh, high, high praise indeed and totally unexpected. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you like what it is we do. So we've a good match here today and I think we're going to have a really good conversation. We'll start the conversation, Richard, with a little bit about you because there will be listeners who aren't familiar with your work. You had quite an interesting past in that you were one of the guys making a hell of a lot of money on Wall Street. What happened? Well, what happened and you know, how did I how did I lose my morals to find my way to New York City and make a bunch of money or what helped happened well, after not, I not gained so my much conscience that. back? We'll we'll start I suppose with the regular paradigm for most people in that money is what people should aspire to and that's a measurement of success. I don't subscribe to that myself and I know you don't, but let's begin with that for for a little while. That's I suppose how it began for you and you were doing really really well in your career. And something happened to change all that for you. Your perspective changed and your life changed resultingly. So let's kind of start from there. You're working on Wall Street. All right. So uh, for, for your podcast audience listening in Ireland, for instance, uh, we'll, we'll keep it to the political angles. Uh, I grew up in a, in a small town in uh, mid in Midwest of the United States. So I wasn't uh, part of the East Coast establishment thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family was not a multi-generational owner of slaves and, uh, you know, rum running and these other ways that people on the East Coast of America had traditionally made their money through American history. And so I was uh, brought up in a place with honest people who, you know, were hardworking. And uh, I was exposed to a lot of media, which, you know, led me into a perspective of in order to be successful in the bigger world, I needed to go off and and make my fortune someplace. So I chose New York City. I worked in the software industry, servicing some of the world's largest financial services institutions. This brought me into uh, a new perspective area where I was witnessing things that I had not been exposed to in my rural upbringing. Uh, I had not been prepared for in my university life. These were things that you only find out by going out and testing yourself against the world. And really what you're testing is what you've been taught versus what you're finding yourself in as far as self-knowledge and juxtaposing that to the environment, your knowledge of the environment. So after several years of you know, following the rules and jumping through the hoops and excelling at every you know, contest or competition or, or whatever, what have you, in order to climb the corporate ladder, I found myself you know, in a lucrative place where I could finally you know, take a deep breath and relax and say, you know, is this, you know, what is there to all this that I'm working for? Why am I working in, in these places doing these things? And I do, you know, you'd think, uh, you know, you do it for money, but what do you want the money, you know, what do you want the money for? What are you doing with the money? And I thought at a certain point, is this all there is to it? Is to earn a bunch of money and then buy things that I'm shown in magazines or TV? And then I started looking at the nature of the transactions and the things that these corporations were doing. And I became very alarmed. And as I became alarmed, I began to ask questions. Now, that started innocently enough, Mm -hmm. asking questions internally to my sales team and the technical people that I was working these accounts with. But once upper management got a a whiff of what I was asking about, I was quickly jettisoned from the, the corporate world because I was no longer serving the institution. You know, I'd start asking questions about the individuals involved in these institutions and the people being taken advantage of by those institutions. And, uh, you know, I had a relapse of conscience and I said, you know, all this money is certainly not worth it. So you have to ask the question, 
what is the cost of money? And then when I asked that question, I discovered that the, the cost of money is sometimes your integrity. And if you want to preserve your integrity, you have to let go of those superficial, transient things that they've taught us to spend money on and learn how to invest your time into relationships and how you treat people and the intelligent actions you take from being an informed, uh, responsible adult. And that's quite a big shift for most people. Um most people, as we all know, are brought up to believe in a certain paradigm and the world is the way that we're told it is, largely through the mainstream media. And when you start to scratch beneath the surface, and you went far further than scratching, I mean, you dug right down beneath that rabbit hole. It doesn't get any deeper. And what kind of things were you discovering, Richard? Well, on a smaller scale, you know, within the, the corporation hierarchy that I was working in, I had clients that were very, like I said, very influential financial services institutions. And so what I was discovering was, you know, on any number of levels, uh, anywhere from uh, them replacing people with electronic processes that no longer had human oversight, uh, which were provably used later on to commit large, large frauds that were hardly punished, if that. I mean, they were maybe taxed, those frauds and thefts, mm -hmm. but they certainly weren't punished for it. Uh, there are other levels of conspiracy between Wall, you know, Wall Street's largest companies, between AIG and Martian McLennan, and, uh, you know, which are you know, the largest insurance company and the reinsurance company in America, I believe. Uh, at this time, and they were 10 years ago. And so what you see is, on a large scale, uh, corporations taking advantage of other corporations and, by default, all of the clients of all of those corporations. And so what you see is, a, you know, it's a, it's a precursor to some of the things I saw after 9-11 uh, as far as what led to the ongoing financial crisis with the subprime loan uh, mortgages that were floated out there and how that could be conducted without oversight catching it without the regulatory agencies, uh, you know, uh, putting their eyes on it and focusing on it and, and, and investigating it. How did that all go unnoticed and why did nobody get fired? I mean, these were all things that I found on my way down the rabbit hole. And then once you, you know, hit rock bottom of the rabbit hole, then you begin to learn your way out. And I'm happy to say that there's, you know, methods and portable tools that you can discover. And that's part of what my podcast does, yep. that you can, you know, find your way out of the rabbit hole and then try to, uh, you know, just keep your balance day to day in, in, in equilibrium in reality, which I think is a very useful tactic to be able to stay on point and meet your goals and find serenity and success. Absolutely, because it's a difficult environment out there for a lot of people, particularly if they're trying to instigate their own change and it goes against the general tide. And it can lead to, I know in my own life, it has certainly led to a certain amount of upheaval and uh, conflict has emerged as well. And you find that some people who aren't necessarily open to your new way of thinking will reject it out of hand. And that can, that can pose problems in personal relationships and that kind of thing. So the tools that you speak of are very, very important, I have found in my life. And it's a, a constant theme with any of the guests we have on Alchemy Radio. People would, would kind of echo that sentiment on a consistent basis. And you mentioned 9-11. Let's talk about 9-11 because you first came to my attention, Richard, with your incredible Project Constellation. And 9-11 was a massive smack in the face and a wake-up call for a huge number of people around the world. You were literally at the coalface. So tell us about that day. Well, that day was really, I mean, I could describe that day using the metaphor of a Orwell quote in which he talks about uh, illusions and how you can hold illusions until they smack up in, against the wall of reality, usually on a battlefield. Mm. What I found that day was my naivete smacking up against the wall of reality, uh, which was uh, terrorism on the streets of New York City, which heretofore had not been imagined, at least, you know, in my mind. And you have, uh, you know, uh, just calamity, chaos, things that, you know, you, you, it was like the furthest thing from any of our minds that something like that was going to happen. So you go through, uh, you know, shock. You don't know what you're witnessing. At first, you know, I'm tuning into the radio and I'm told it's an accident, that it's a helicopter that's hit the, the World Trade Center, that it was a Cessna that hit the World Trade Center. And then, you know, later, you know, you find out uh, after I left the scene that, you know, it's a, a commercial airliner that allegedly uh, made the building blow up. And then you go through, you know, all the other details after that. But, you know, uh, witnessing something like that is certainly a, a traumatic event. And if you witnessed it on TV, like most people did around the world, what you're witnessing is a snuff film. 
that's being shown over and over to traumatize an audience. Mm. And the people showing it to you were not victims. Okay? Yeah. They were not victims of it. They were people who participated in the profiteering from that event and did so for, for many years after. We have this thing called a post-9-11 era because 9-11 is used to justify so many changes, drastic, irrational changes in the 21st century. It's like, a, a, you know, it's a free pass for irrationality and tyranny and despotism and the removal of the individual rights that allow each of us to survive and thrive in this world. And so when, you know, when you experience something like that firsthand, and I left during the events, I was not in New York City when the towers actually fell. I left after the second, uh, th after the south, south Tower, the second building uh, erupted in the flames, at which point I knew it wasn't an accident that this was something that was being orchestrated. And I, you know, I fled the scene because I was in terror. And up until that point in my life, you know, <laughs> I had never been in terror before. I didn't know, you know, you know, you get scared of, you know, things when you're a kid or whatever. Yeah. But as an adult, as somebody that day who was, I was in a, you know, a Porsche 911 Carrera with the top down. Like I was, you know, up until that point, I was living a pretty good life. It was a beautiful sunny morning. And then that happens and, and you, you know, you witness it, and then, of course, you know, a lot of the people that worked at my largest client, Marsha McLennan, which was on 94th through 98th floors of the World Trade Center 1, over 300 of those people died. So people that I had been working with for you know, over a year mm. perished. And you have questions about that, and you have questions about the people who didn't go to work that day. You have questions about the people who hired the people that, you know, stayed home that day and what their agendas are. And you find out it's a father and son team that's running AIG and Marsha McLennan. And then there's insider trading that was on Marsha McLennan and American Airlines. And according to the official story, American Airlines intersects with Marsha McLennan on the day of 9-11. So it's like in close proximity to that, I felt it was my job. I felt it a moral imperative to look deeper because what I was seeing was evidence that it was not Muslim terrorists who were behind the events or profiting from those events. And once you dig into that, it only gets deeper, and that's where you start to learn about the real history of the world we live in. And how did you begin that process then, Richard? Because, I mean, you've gone very deep into the rabbit, rabbit hole, as we described already, but it had to start somewhere, and I guess with baby steps. Now, you were uniquely positioned in that, apart from the fact that you were working in World Trade Center, the business that you were working in as well is so, so, so tied into the whole conspiracy that you had access to a lot of information that other people wouldn't normally have. So where did you begin to scratch beneath the surface? Well, I mean, I began just by doing the normal things, by attending the memorial services for my coworkers. And I remember a particular, you know, it was, I guess you can call it a mass memorial service because it was held for the workers of Marsha McLennan in St. Pat in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, which is a very famous uh, cathedral, and uh, I believe St. Patrick was Irish, so it's appropriate for this conversation. Inside that cathedral was this uh, son of a gangster named uh, Rudolph Giuliani and his other cronies uh, standing watch over the people, the victims, the families. And I found that to be just some of the things to be said, kind of to be offbeat. And it started, you know, started me thinking. And then, uh, you know, a week or so later, I saw in, uh, in articles about uh, the insider trading on specific companies that were adversely affected and how, you know, there's put options. And when you trace those, those trades back, it led to Buzzy Krongard, who was uh, the third in command at the CIA and now a, a Wall Street banker at that time. And Mayo Shattuck, who was also involved in the Deutsche Bank transactions, and those were private. You know, those were private clients of the my employer in 2001. So being in the middle of here's these companies, obviously with insider information, they're using electronic trading systems to take advantage of the situation. I'm working for a company at that time that's helping to provide the capabilities and electronic trading for that to happen. I started to dig deeper. I only started, you know, and what I came into contact with was, hey. You know, meet your United States intelligence agencies. Here's how the world works in the Anglo-American establishment. Here's how British empire and colonialism has crept into America and changed the attitudes, behaviors, beliefs of Americans over the past 100 years uh, since the death of Cecil Rhodes. And so what I got into was not more conspiracy theory. It's history that we as Americans should have been taught 
in order to prevent ourselves from being taken advantage of in such a way that we were on 9-11. And I think at the root of that is, um, I've heard you describe in the past corporations as being almost like sociopathic entities in that corporations can make decisions against humans, but there's nobody accountable because th there is no humanity in a corporate structure. And is that really at the root of the problem for you, Richard? Well, I think accountability is uh, something that we should all value. And when you don't have any local accountability, something we should all be concerned with and maybe question. When you look at a corporate structure, now you're, look, uh, I would use the example of, of the Nuremberg defense given by the Nazis where they said they were just following orders and what you can hear any broker on Wall Street today, you know, saying the same thing. They're not following orders, but they have a fiduciary responsibility to the, you know, the shareholder. It's the same thing. So it's the moral ambiguity, and why do we have moral ambiguity? Because we've lost these, these ideas of common sense and morality and reason and rationality and logic. And that's why every single problem we can notice in the world, it's a sign of irrationality. Well, irrationality festers in the absence of reason. So I think the destruction of the individual's ability to use our innate cognitive faculties to discern reality from fiction, I think that's been corrupted. And I think to kill off common sense is the essential form of control that's practiced on this planet. And I think so much of it is perpetuated by the mainstream media. And you discovered that in 2006 when you put together your project Constellation, which was intended initially for media outlets. And it was your, your whistleblowing in a sense. And you ran into a lot of problems when you tried to get the information out there initially in that you fell on deaf ears all the time. How frustrating was that? Well, it was one of the most frustrating experiences of my life. And if you go to tragedyandhope.com under podcasts, you can find Project Constellation. It was the first recording that I made. And I made it as a, a message to the future of America. Really, it's a message to the future of the world. Anybody who wanted to listen at that time could hear that from 2001 through 2006, I explored all of the, the official roots of, of blowing the whistle, going to the media, going to court. Like When they say that someone like Edward Snowden didn't go through channels, mm. I can just say, if you go through channels, all you're going to do is, is find a lot of failure and frustration and discuss it as rigged a lot slower than other ways that you could do it. So I'm not, I, you know, I don't mean to bring Snowden into the conversation, but... Much of what I stated in Project Constellation in 2006 is echoed by Snowden because I was saying the government is collecting taxes to use, you know, to invest in these private contractors who are using the, da the data processing that's being outsourced from the intelligence agencies to collect and process and build profiles just like the Gulag system on American citizens. And now it's being done all over the world. As you've you know, heard in recent news, the NSA was spying on all sorts of world leaders. I don't know why my tax dollars are going into such activities, and that's why since 2003 I've basically dedicated my life to the philanthropy of inspiring people to learn how to think for themselves, to be individual, self-confident, self-reliant, have some real self-esteem because only then can you lead and help others to do likewise. Only in a world where we can be autonomous thinkers can we realize the non-necessity of government, and until we can do that, Government must exist, and right now we're being abused by governments in this thing that we call the state, which is very much like a corporation. It's a, you know, it's a superficial, subjective idea that does not exist unless we give it power as individuals. What exists in reality, in objective reality, are individuals, and we must all learn to think for ourselves, process our own information, and sustain ourselves in certain ways to remain alive. Those are what I call the facts of life. We've gotten away from that. Too many people's activities have gone, you know, and been invested in these habits that go in striking contrast to what we need as individuals to survive, what we need for our families and friends to, to, to thrive, right? So if we've been, you know, having those tools taken away through the education system systematically for at least the last 113 years, uh, you know, I can, th I can show you through the, the various history documents mm -hmm. of both America and Britain. So, you know, it's a systematic, uh, incremental system of changing all of our belief systems, all of our attitudes, values, and behaviors to be 180 degrees contradictory to our needs of survival. 
So I'm just saying as a conscious human being who's an, a, an adult who sees this, uh, I'm trying to integrate what I see so that we can uh, all grow together. And we do that through learning about what's been going on, what that history is, and once realizing where we are, how to get to where we want to go. Pertinent indeed. And I think it's very important to look at the lessons that we that, that, that so many people have learned down through the years because we're, so many of us are thrown into the state education system, wherever it might be in the world, and we battle through our 15 to 20 years of, of so-called education. When in essence, what we really need to be doing then when we come out of that system is to unlearn what we've been taught in the past and to organically experience things for ourselves as opposed to blindly just accepting what's been foisted upon us. But the education system really is... I suppose at the root of it for so many people, I remember being in school at a very young age and I was always somebody who questioned. Now, not with any great overall world view or anything, but I, I, I would always question authority and people would say, particularly teachers would say, well, John, you have a serious problem with authority. It wasn't that I was necessarily a bad person, but I was, I, I had a problem with being told what to do without any good reason given for it or if it went against my own gut feeling, I wouldn't necessarily cooperate let's put it that way and i know in the states now big pharma has a huge part to play in this it's all about cooperation so let's get the kids on on ritalin or whatever it might be to control them and we've all these manufactured diseases and there's so much happening it's it's a grand grand conspiracy from the ground up and when i say the ground i mean the youth and the children of today and it puts so many of us at a disadvantage when we do finally decide one day that things are not the way we've been taught because we have to kind of reverse what's come before and start again with the building blocks in a sense exactly what you did post 9-11 would, would that be a, a kind of accurate assessment I think it's an accurate assessment and I could add some much needed details in there because it's you know my personal growth is a reflection of that which I surrounded myself with and when you're talking about this this you know connotation of maybe you know unschooling our uh, ourselves and, and unlearning these inaccurate things that we've been conditioned to think was knowledge in the first place you're really talking about the dichotomy between education and schooling which is the same thing after you graduate as leadership versus management schooling leads to management of human resources schooling putting together of minds artificially through that process of 15,000 hours creates very manageable, servile, non-thinking people who have to wait to be told to do things. Education is the unocculting or unhiding of useful information of living. And once you integrate those ideas into your life and you're balanced in, in you know, all the different areas that you need to be competent of self-knowledge and knowledge of your environment, then you can be a leader. And I think the world needs more leaders who are creating more leaders because I don't think there's a hierarchy of people insofar as nature. I think that has to be artificially maintained and groomed by an elite ruling class system. And I'm not saying that there's any group of secret people at a table in control. What I'm noticing is there is a corrupt philosophy, a philosophical corruption of our reality insofar as people who think they can use violence and fraud and coercion to rule over the lives of others and to make decisions on their behalf. So I applaud you for being a questioner early on because I didn't question all that stuff. I thought the people who got here before me had asked all the questions and they were satisfied, so I should be satisfied too. And then some buildings blow up in your face one day. Mm. And you're like, wow, nobody else was paying attention either. Maybe I should start thinking for myself. Maybe I should start sharing what I learned. And maybe I can, you know, just share part of that journey. I, I encountered people like John Taylor Gatto. And once I realized the, the basic component of how Americans were dumbed down such that in many, you know, after a decade plus of 9-11, you know, post 9-11 culture, people still don't know the basics of the crime scene and, and, and don't realize the basic contradictions that should lead to irrefutable proof that we're all being lied to. There's still like cognitive dissonance and dissent around those areas. And the reason why is instilled through the public education system. So when we filmed John Taylor Gatto for the ultimate history lesson, which is a compendium of all his, all of his research in one interview, uh, it's, it's laid out. You can see a chronological timeline of how our minds and, and abilities to reason our way out of problems were corrupted. This shows up today uh, in learned helplessness in the population, in the cognitive dissonance of children in school, and the pathologizing of that descent to put them on the pharmaceutical drugs that you were mentioning. 
So tying this all together with a, a project we did earlier this year, uh, State of Mind, the Psychology of Control, it really provides the history of how words have been used over centuries and, and millennia to control human beings with the caveat today being there are many, many advanced technological means of controlling people that are leveraging all the traditional social, uh, you know, human resource control me mechanisms and, and um, psychology. So the data they've collected over millennia is now being put into practice and action in creating a, an electronic harness for individuals, which people in the future will not be able to easily escape, which is why it's so important that you and Stevie do what you do to get the word out now, because you know, I just can I consider myself somebody who's uh, you know I'm providing a warning. It's a it's a critical warning, and it's also a, a beam of hope. Here's some real tangible tools that can help you you know learn your way through the situation. But the situation is that the truth is you know somewhat belligerent. Belligerent. It exists. It's out there. It's not sugary sweet like a Hollywood movie. You know, and the happy ending is going to take a lot of work. Uh, both individually and collaboratively, but it should all be work done out of free will and voluntary cooperation with others because we got on the same page, realized that we have the same needs and that we need to work together in order to survive and thrive in the face of these uh, predators, intraspecific kleptoparasites, people of the same species who have been preying on us and plundering us for, for a long time. And we'll continue to do so as long as we continue to give them the power that they have because it, it comes from us, essentially. And you mentioned evidence because evidence is very, very important. The evidence is there, as you said. I think there is a problem, though, in that most people, unless that evidence is plonked right in front of them on ABC or NBC or RTE in Ireland or BBC in the UK, whatever it is, unless it's shown to them through the usual accepted mainstream channels, well, then they don't, they're not willing to go and look for it themselves. And... One of the questions that so many people have since I started doing Alchemy Radio have come to me with is, well, where do I begin to research? And my answer, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Richard, to those people is, well, obviously I can give people links to YouTube videos or to book titles or whatever it might be. It has to begin with reading because nobody is going to necessarily on a plate shove this information in front of you. You have to go and, and look. It is there. It's all, be it online or be it in libraries or in books or whatever it is, the evidence that we need to see the way the world is as opposed to the picture that's painted for us is actually out there. So I get very frustrated when people talk about conspiracy um, and conspiracy theory as if it's a negative thing. I think that the term conspiracy has been bastardized and has become a derogatory term or the, the tinfoil hat wearing brigade uh, that, that's the image that's conjured up for so many people. But I think if people got back to books or to reading in whatever form, electronic reading, whatever it is now, that's where they'll really empower themselves from the get-go. What, what are your thoughts on it, Richard? I think this is where hope transforms itself into action. Find what inspires you and start to, you know, I, I, what I did was I bought used books. I found books that only cost a penny. I mean, sometimes the shipping costs you know, uh, more than the book because the books are so cheap. I didn't want to see what was on the internet. I didn't want to see things without references. I wanted to look at primary fact, primary resources, the original documents, autobiographies, biographies by the, of the people involved that were there at the time. And that's where I started to dig in to get my facts and to you know, escape that rabbit hole mentality because if you just believe what you see on the internet, uh, you're in trouble. And I think that literacy is a form of slavery until critical thinking, a method of critical thinking is exercised consistently as a habit by the reader, mm. meaning that we're all prepared to consume lies and believe them as true. That's the default setting that our education system gives us. What we need are the tools to help discern the contradictions and remove them from our thinking and dismiss them as arbitrary so we can focus on the substance. Then, all of a sudden, research and your everything that is interesting to you just went up to you know ten ten notches on on, on the whatever scale you want to measure it metaphorically because it becomes more interesting, more potent. The saturation is there. There's more there, more meaning, and it, you know, and so you start to be elevated by the learning process because now you're being literally you know, or I guess this is in in this case it's uh, a literal metaphor. You're being elevated out of ignorance by your own process of learning how to learn anything. 
and then focusing on it, focusing that you know that power that intellect on whatever inspires you and what inspires me is discovering what is being done to make us servile slaves and what can be done to communicate the solutions to individuals who are interested in exploring cognitive liberty and it's an absolutely fascinating process. Now, I'm going to play a devil's advocate for a second because there will be listeners who are screaming at the radios or their computers or whatever it might be. And they're saying, well, lads, that's all very well, but I'm perfectly happy with the world the way it is. I get a nice wage and I have the kids and the wife and everything is fine for me. Why should I worry? Why should I listen to these conspiracy theories? Again, in inverted commas, who are crying foul and they're, they're, they're fear mongering. And there are a lot of people who perceive reality as fear-mongering when, in fact, there is a big difference, I think. And you, you've spoken about that in the past. Well, I'd argue that most people who think it's fear-mongering are scared of reality because the reality is your, your ignorant actions, meaning that you are ignoring reality, are raining chaos on your progeny and your friends and family and everybody who follows after us because we now have an opportunity to be response-able, able to respond to the, to the decades of irrationality that have built up. We only have this ability to respond because we have communicable, portable tools so we can all be on the same page and say, oh, what is a fact? What is truth? Oh, truth is something that has gone through the process and the trouble of occurring. Now let's apply that to 9-11. Now let's apply it to what you think is evidence that you haven't looked at. Assuming that you have knowledge without asking the questions is the form of mind control that I am talking about being practiced on individuals by people who have more information. And that's simply the story of human history. People have occulted or hidden useful information in order to control others. That is the underlying theme of every piece of human history that is available for the past 5,000 years. So if you want to ignore that reality, you have the right to do that. If you want to be happy in ignorance and think that's bliss, you, can't, you can do that. But I would argue that without the comparison, you really don't have knowledge. I think so. And I think eventually we do reap what we sow, to use the old cliche, because so much. Let's look at the US for a second. And US, I suppose, the, the bastion of liberty, if we're to believe what we're told all the time. And everything is about freedom and the Constitution. However, post 9-11, with acts such as the Patriot Act, essentially what we're looking at being rolled out before our very eyes, should we choose to believe it or not, the, the facts of the matter are, we're looking at a new form of corporate dictatorship and the people are simply chattel who are there to, uh, to, to keep the wheels turning for those who are in power. And all the distractionary TV and sport and whatever else it might be in the world isn't going to disguise the fact that the truth remains the truth. And I think that's one of the problems that certainly I had in the beginning when I started to kind of wake up to what was going on a little bit. I would hide behind my comfort zone, which may have been love of football, for example, or music or whatever else it might be. And I thought, right, well, that's if, if I focus on that, I don't have to look the other direction. But eventually you're going to be pushed in that other direction, whether you like it or not. And somebody comes knocking or something lands on your doorstep and you get that wake up call. 9-11 being that wake up call for so many people around the world. Do you think at the, mo at the moment the atmosphere in the US is one of hope, of despair, or is it of simply distraction across the, uh, the kind of general majority? Do people know what's going on? I I'm going to give you a, a mixed answer. Uh, the current atmosphere, pff, man, people are dumb. They're getting dumber all the time. You know what I'm saying, John? I yep. mean, I, I just go out there and people are less and less conscious of their actions and yet they're increasingly comforted by their non-action participation in reality, right? It's like they're going through all the motions, but they're not conscious of it, and they're attached to these smart devices, and the content they're screening in most cases, uh, you know, members of this uh, audience excluded, in most cases are just dumbed down content. And the reason that the content is getting dumber is because it makes the advertisements work better on those channels. And as somebody who doesn't have commercials, you and I... Uh, can agree that it, you know, in order to have 
knowledgeable content out there. It can't be broken up by, you know, every couple minutes, let me make you think about something else. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a structure. There's a time and place for that. I know that you're paying for your time when you listen to commercials inadvertently that you didn't want to listen to. And so I just simply give people the choice, as do you, it, to support us directly. I feel that, that way has more integrity and honesty because then I'm just delivering a service. Mm-hmm. I'm deliver, delivering the service of showing you all these cool things that I found and they go together like this and sometimes I add some things on. But the point is, I'm just trying to show people people, here's a map of what exists out there that can help you get through these things that you, you know, everyone else wants to take advantage of you for. And, and we put them out there for free because it needs to be out there. This content has been hidden for thousands of years. So, and it's just basic common sense. And for a while in America, there was such a thing as common sense, but that was snuffed out because the British Empire saw America as such a threat that for, de- for generations, they went ab- about a process to try to take over America and recolonize it. And that came to a head in 1902 in the format of Cecil Rhodes' Last Will and Testament. And uh, the Rhodes Scholarships, their whole job is to undermine the education of America to bring about a more Oxfordian society. Oxonian society, as they would say at Oxford. Oxonian uh, is uh, the Latin version. But, you know, the, it's an instilling of British colonial culture in America, and they wouldn't have had to do that in 1902 if America hadn't been so free and getting out of control and you know being uppity against the empire. The empire never forgets, and slowly but surely, we have been infected, and that's you know where Americas are. They are anesthetized by the numbness. The numbness and the dumbness, I think, are connected. Mm. They're numb to reality because they're dumb to themselves. They are not getting to know themselves. They do not. Uh, you know, the, the Delphi, uh, the Oracle of Delphi was Temet Noski. Know thyself. Of course, if you knew yourself and knew how to learn anything for yourself, you wouldn't be going to some lady who sniffs vapors for your facts. Yeah, sure. Which is why that went extinct when they came out with reason. They're like, hey, we don't need to go to the Oracle of Delphi anymore. We actually have logic and reason. We can examine that which exists, remove the contradictions, sniff out the lies, and get to the truth. That's meaningful. That makes progress. That makes people strong and self-reliant. And only then can they you know, help others effectively. So I think there's a happy medium of integrating our knowledge of self and our knowledge of our environment. And that would be great if we just you know, told people about that and didn't have to traumatize them through these crazy events, right? So I'm just saying that uh, if there's going to be people that rule the planet and want to make decisions on our behalf, they could be a little bit more forthright and moral about it if it's going to go on because it does go on we don't have elected leaders i'm not that naive anymore so i'm just saying if they're going to do it do it so none of us know about it anymore or the rest of us have to learn our way out of this tyranny i think that's where we're at to escape despotism we must learn i agree 100 percent. and just to pick up on the elected leaders point again we'll play devil's advocate of course we have elected leaders you have Obama in the US, we have Enda Kenny in Ireland. They're elected leaders all over the democratic world. And what's the problem? I mean, we, we, don't we get to go to the polls every four years, Richard, and get to change the leaders if we don't like them? Surely that's okay. All right, so let's, let me just start at, uh, at what, I, what I'll say is ground zero of this argument. Mm. Uh, John, you and I are individuals, right? Indeed. Can I come over to your house and steal some stuff? I'd rather you didn't. No, I don't think so. And you can't do that here. No. So we're, on, we're, we're individuals and we're equal. Now, can you and I gang up against someone else in our community and go take their stuff? I suppose we shouldn't be doing that either. I, I'd be against that anyway. All right, because it causes problems down the line. So there's reasons to act reasonable and logical and rational. Yeah. Now, if, if, if some group of people came and said, we've got powers that you don't have, we're this thing called state or government, we have the right to put people in cages, we have the right to carry deadly force and protect ourselves, but you don't have these rights, where did they get those rights if they are my representative? It's a very interesting question and one that I don't have the answer to, despite my initial question to you. But everyone, but everyone acts like... They have those answers, right? They're like, oh, it's government and it's the, you know, the authorities and it's the military. Like where in American foreign policy did we ever come up with the right to go into foreign countries and conduct you know, decade-long campaigns using the, 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 the taxpayer dollars, which are taken at the threat of force here in this country? So, you know, I'm not saying that having a king or queen is any better than what we have here in America. I'm just saying maybe we can all question our way a couple inches or you know, a couple steps toward liberty in our lifetime. 
because I don't have any, you know, false impressions that the world can be peaceful without conflict. I'm just saying the point it's gotten to now is at a level of idiocracy where I think we can all just agree that we could turn it down a couple levels through applying our intellect into our social situations that we, you know, that we occupy throughout our days. Yeah, I think you're dead right. And it's not normally done because sometimes I get the impression that we're living in a world of social memes whereby people are living their lives according to meaningless catchphrases such as when it comes to justifying war well you can't say anything bad about war because you have to support our troops or when it comes to uh, George Bush who was so unpopular we need to get rid of him so let's have Mr. Change so we we'll bring in Barack Obama and people really buy into these these catchphrases and a lot of that stems back I suppose to uh, to the work of, of Edward Bernays and people like that right back to the early part of the 20th century and probably for decades and eons before that too. But I think what we're experiencing now is the uh, the resonance of the work that was done in so many of these institutions that were set up in the early early part of the 20th century. What can you tell us about that? Because we're talking essentially about a form of mind control here. Well, you're talking directly about the echoes and memes, uh, you know, uh, of of decades of American culture and history that are it's absolutely mind control. And what I mean by that is it's information that is presented that is false. That because you don't know it's false, you've uh, uh, you know integrated it as truth, as knowledge. You've amended your beliefs, attitudes, behaviors. You know, these are that's the very definition of brainwashing for an institution to be able to do that to you through words. It doesn't have to be, you know, put some helmet on you and do some kind of MK Ultra experiment, though that was also done with, you know, with American tax dollars for many decades. Uh, and in our film, State of Mind, The Psychology of Control, which uh, I was a co-writer on, I'm interviewed in it, and we were co-producers of it with Free Mind Films, uh, we show how Bernays, Edward Bernays, the father of propaganda, uh, you know, came up with ways, instead of, you know, to instill the public with common sense, to use the absence of common sense to drive fear through consumption and, you know, in these superficial products, uh, conspicuous consumption is, is how some people call it, where your self-esteem comes from these things that you buy with money, mm. which again, is a, it's an ignorant form of wealth. The, the richest form of wealth, the true form of wealth is wisdom in a form of an understanding that can be communicated consisting of knowledge to other people. That is useful in survival. All those other things are not. You know, all those things that you see in GQ or any of those magazines, you get it, you know, that, that are out there that are showing you this is how you live with money. Look, I tried that stuff. It doesn't work. You will bump up against reality at some point. I'm just saying it's better to prepare for that day and be proactive about it than to let it randomly happen to you in what I call an unscheduled or unplanned meeting because it's going to throw you into chaos and it's going to take you a while to get back on balance. So what I can say about people who say something like support the troops is you can overcome all of these memes with this thing called a question mark. Support the troops? Well, wouldn't that be bringing them home and giving them, you know, putting them back with their families and letting them be employed and get back to their lives yeah. instead of fighting some phony war on terrorism where, you know, according to Trevor Aronson, who's a, a respected journalist and author, he wrote a book called The Terror Factory Inside the FBI's Manufactured War on Terror in and no, you know, no, no punches are pulled. He tells you straight out, American tax dollars are used by the FBI to create false terrorist attacks in this country to justify the war on terror and the ever-increasing budgets of all those intelligence agencies that are now spying on people around the world. So we as Americans have to recognize that we are being abused, we are being terrorized, and our own money is being withdrawn from us to do that. Now, we have a voluntary role to play in a lot of things, but you know, some things like taxes, they're going to put you in a cage if you don't participate in that game. So people are unwillingly at this point participating in something that they can't get out of, which is, it, it also plays into the anesthetization of the American popula population because they've learned helplessness. They don't think there's a way out. So it's up to us to create media and create new memes consisting of knowledge mm. that help them to learn their way out as individuals and as individuals discover useful media in the, in the form of independent, commercial-free media that is uh, created with integrity and presents you with the primary references and the knowledge you need to communicate it to others credibly and cogently. You know, you know, in the face of the problem, you have to do what you can to be part of the solution. If not, what are we all here living for? So, Richard, let's talk about attachment for a second, because inadvertently we have been for the last while and talking about people attaching themselves to whatever it might be. So it could be 
the flag of their nation or it could be uh, their vicarious living through a celebrity magazine, whatever it might be. People are attaching all the time and they're attaching to memes that they're not creating themselves. I think the biggest one, possibly, and what are your views on it? That's what I'd like to know. Money. Because for me, the attachment to money is, well, maybe not at the root of everything evil. It's certainly not a positive influence and it's a huge controlling factor in what's going on at the moment. Well, I think money's a tool. I think it's magnetic. And I think that when controlled by certain people, by certain means, uh, specifically a centralized monopoly using fiat currency uh, combined with compound interest in specific, uh, I think that it becomes a tool of despotism and destructive nature. I think it attracts greedy people who have an issue and can't be satisfied at any level, which I think we should all recognize as dangerous. If you have a billion dollars and you're not hearing the word no because everyone around you wants some of your money, then that's not good for you as an individual. And it's certainly not good for the people you know, uh, around the world who are being uh, you know, on the other end of those transactions and might be feeling some of the tyranny or despotism if you're an arms manufacturer creating smart bombs or drones or something like that, for instance. I don't have any problems of uh, items or tools or strategies of personal and self-defense. I think that's necessary in this world. Mm. Even without people, there are predators here who will eat us uh, if we're not careful and we need to protect ourselves, and that gets into basic needs. I think the attractivity or the magnetism with money is uh, juxtaposed to the, the needs that human beings have as, as individuals and money becomes a useful tool for transitioning from a state of scarcity into abundance by way of meeting your needs, having a house, having shelter, uh, supplying your nutrition, getting your health through food and not through some bogus Obamacare health plan or any of these things. But we've lost the commonsensical knowledge to invest our, our resources and our hard work converted into money, uh, into these activities that would actually benefit ourselves, our friends, our family, our coworkers, all these things that bring balance and serenity and productivity and, and creativity and inspiration in a country that needs it. If we don't have jobs in America, if we have a jobs problem, we'll look around. Are there any problems? Problems need solutions. Solutions need products and or services plus sales. That's how you create jobs. That's the equation. People in the American government who work you know, through their MBAs and all these different things on their CV, they have no idea what that equation is. And therefore, they're not my leader. I don't think they're anyone's leader. I don't know where they're leading except into more chaos. And when you look at their activities, it's about plundering, not building. It's about tearing down, not constructing anything new. So if, if, if there is to be a revitalization, whether it's in Ireland or anywhere else in the world, uh, you know, aside from America, we all have to do the same things and recognize that it's no longer a, a, you know, a planet of nations, that her, there has been a global cartel uh, working behind the scenes in politics and economics and education, and it's been adversely affecting people and individuals all over the planet, regardless of what imaginary line we find ourselves behind. Like I said, uh, you know, uh, before we started this interview, I don't remember volunteering for this game. And I would like to see some bumper stickers out there and, and see more people that also did not volunteer for this game. And I'm just trying to cope as an individual within a, a, a very comprehensive and well thought out framework that is designed to get us to volunteer mm. into our own slavery. And I'm not the first individual to recognize this. I mean, I mean, all forms of media are created on, on earlier forms of media. So my reference would be Etienne Delabuetti, who was a Frenchman back in, I believe, the 15th century, who wrote a treatise on uh, voluntary servitude. And he basically says the way that the kings and the, the different politicians work is they get you to volunteer little by little, incrementally, into all these various things that you assume you know what you're doing, a marriage license, a driver's license, a mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, student loans, all these different items that bind us down and control our actions and say, well, I have to do it for my job because my kids got to eat and I got to pay for the car and they got to go to school and all these different expenses are used to justify people's corporate jobs and just, you know, I'm doing it because my boss told me to. Well, there, there comes a line where you are taking actions in immoral ways and helping people build out their plans and strategies to dominate and conquer other people, rip them off, defraud them, what have you. And you have to realize that without your action, 
in that process, they can't do it. They can come up with the ideas, but they need dupes. They need unwitting dupes who make assumptions, and that's the definition of mind control, to assume, to think you have knowledge without asking the questions. And they need people like I used to be. I try not to be so naive, and, and I try not to be a good tool for them or earn too much money for them and pay into a system of, that I don't agree on. But uh, without your help, without your voluntary servitude, the system that we call this, this despotism that's taken over the planet in the last hundred years could not run efficiently. It would be like taking the oil out of an engine. And I'm just saying, if you, if you want that to, you know, engine to stop producing this ill will that's been created through all the uh, misuse of American resources, then we got to do something to incapacitate that engine. And I think what we can do as individuals is withdraw our voluntary servitude mm that we've made through all these various assumptions, which again gets into the, the psychology of control, how individuals are controlled by words that are either written down or spoken into existence, and they reflect things that are not true. And in a society where everyone had intellectual self-defense, uh, these, these phrases would be dismissed as arbitrary that are uttered out there about, you know, support our troops. No, that's not supporting our troops. It's not supporting America. It's not, even, it's not supporting anything that we agree with and yet, um, like a, a huge amount of the tax dollars in this country collected are used for military aggression. It's not defense. If, if America acted moral and upright and reflected the values of logic and reason, we wouldn't need to defend ourselves against anybody except the empire. You're dead right. I heard a phrase that Obama used when the, uh, the news broke about the NSA monitoring of, um, of German politicians and Angela Merkel. And he said, well... He justified it or tried to justify it by saying, well, it's for our own defense and it's for homeland security. And I remember thinking to myself, and even as somebody who does look into uh, the, the global situation in some depth, I remember thinking, surely there's, there's nobody who could actually listen to a phrase like that coming from Barack Obama and, and believe it. Because to me, it just seems so ludicrous, so, so outrageous that we have to infringe on other people's civil liberties or kill other people in different countries, whatever it might be, and, and that that can be in some way construed as defence. Attack isn't defence. Attack is attack, always. And defence is defence if somebody is attacking you. But to, to go into Iraq and to bomb a million people or whatever, or to go into Afghanistan and fight this, this war on terror, that's not defence. Who are you defending us against? It's, to me, it's absolutely ridiculous, but so many people seem to buy into the lie. Well, and that's the problem that we're trying to address by creating our own media. And to start it off and then bring it full circle, I'll take these two you know, uh, separate pieces of information. I'm going to mash them together here over the next couple of minutes. Recently, there was an article posted by an internet website called The Business Insider, very respectable establishment website. Mm -hmm. And the title is, last year, President Obama reportedly told his aides that, quote, he's really good at killing people. So this is the 2009 Nobel Prize winner yeah. saying that he's really good at making the decisions that lead to other people's death. Now, let's juxtapose that news article to something called natural law philosophy, which is a study of that which exists. That's reality. That's mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. Yeah. Now, I'm interested in that uh, from many perspectives, but recently I went to film a, a seminar that was being held here uh, nearby in New Haven at Yale University's campus. It was a speaker named Mark Passio, who I would highly recommend, uh, since you've already interviewed Jan Irvin and several other people who I highly respect, I would recommend uh, Mark Passio, if you haven't interviewed him yet, maybe I missed it in the list. No, we haven't. He, did a, he recently did a seminar, it was a 10-hour seminar that I fil filmed, and it'll be, uh, be available uh, on the internet in a couple weeks when I'm done editing. But basically, the whole talk is about natural law, and what he, what he gets down to, to boil it down is it's the art of being able to tell fact from fiction uh, to be, you know, it's the difference between morality and immorality. It's uh, truth uh, versus the, the things that these illusions that are created through words. So really it's about how to navigate through your life, you know, using this method day by day to stay in equilibrium. And that involves being able to identify, uh, you know, that non-aggression is one principle, but self-defense is another principle that we all need as individuals in order to survive and thrive and collaborate and cooperate with others in a peaceful way. This is what leads to civilization and progress and happiness and serenity and all those things that we're all striving after. But it means a little work with ourselves and it means a little work with other people, which is a great thing because there's lots of people here and you know they're all interesting. So as you as you go forward, you know, through my progression, 
as I find people with various amounts of wealth, I try to get myself out there and create a piece of media so that other people who weren't there for the live seminar can see it. So I find it worth several weeks of my time because once you boil that down, it's going to equate to tens, hundreds, thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, list, uh, of viewers, right? So you're able to take a couple days or a couple weeks of work and really put it to work in the future in a continuing way that when people find it and then they go through it for themselves and they go through the learning process, they find it empowering. And I find that to be a very good use of my time. I find it, uh, you know, a very, a f- not fruitful, but very... <sighs> satisfying mm. experience to be able to not only learn these things for myself, but also to have the responsibility to take those additional steps to create media, to share it with other people that they can share with their friends and family and coworkers and so on. I see this as being the natural way of uh, defending ourselves, the natural immune system of this planet, because we are organisms that come from this planet. We are, you know, uh, all the things that we need for, for survival are affixed to this planet. Right, yeah. so we just have to look at this. We we are involved in this system that we're participating in, but most of our lives, up until a certain point, we were not really thinking about the nature of all these things. We're denied those rites of passages that would have put these ideas into our mind. The, you know, there's rites of passages passage around the world that could have thrown you know fear into me at an earlier age in a controlled circumstance where I could learn from it in a constructive way, rather than be witness to the murder of three thousand people. Mm. Right, I'm just saying that there, you know, the, what's going on is a very crude uh, operation, and that I don't think we're being led by the best among us. I don't think the best and brightest people are finding their way anywhere near the top of this structure, because basically, when you look at the top of the structure, it's being run by psychopaths and sociopaths who, yes, have logic and reason uh, juxtaposed to their own survival, but they don't understand the nature of cooperation and collaboration, and they don't recognize the immorality of their actions. They have a, a corrupt philosophy because they've never been exposed to the truth, because they've never cared about it, because they've led a comfortable life that never made them look at it, mm. right? And so when you look at how psychopaths are using our emotions against us to control us, and you ask the question, how is it done?, and you analyze, well, you know, what are emotions? Oh, that's how we feel about what we think. Well, what is thinking? Thinking is a process of non-contradictory identification of that which exists. So if we're not actually going through the process of asking questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how, and answering those questions, that is the process of thinking. If you're doing something else that's based on assumption, it's based on uh, what, what they would say in Latin as citicism, P-S-I-T-T-A-C-I-S-M, mm-hmm. to repeat or parrot something you've heard without thinking about it. So that's something, that's the, that's the, the mechanics of an animal. And the people that run the place, uh, you know, the, that are instilling their will over large populations, they believe that we are like clockwork oranges. They believe like we're, that, that we're like animals, that we don't have the ability to use question marks, and we, that, that we operate on stimulus response. Well, once again, Stimulus response is the very definition of mind control. When you are hearing something and taking action or seeing something and taking action without asking questions in between, that is the absence of freedom. That is literal slavery. That is mind control. And the way to overcome it is to put thinking between the stimulus and the response. Stimulus, whole bunch of questions. Now you have an informed response. Now you're not under control. Now you're not in the herd. And the methods to bring about these processes in a consistent manner can be very useful habits because, again, reflecting back to state of mind, the psychology of control, the theme throughout that film is that habit is the enormous flywheel of society, its most precious conservative agent. It is what keeps the fishermen out there doing the hard work in the winter and keeps the rich people where they are profiting from everyone else's hard work, right? Yeah. So that was, that was uh, me massacring a, a William James quote from his book, Psychology. But, uh, you know, <laughs> without digressing any further, did that answer your question? It absolutely did. And it, it just brings to mind, um, when we, you mentioned, I suppose, the people at the top of the power tree um, are those that we can see as visibly being there. So we, we look at politicians, we look at Obama, whoever else. And all, all these people, George Bush, I think, was a good example of somebody who... I mean, what they're, what they're selling is this, this kind of snake oil. It's based on faith or, as you said, assumption or some kind of 
ideology. It's it's never an observation based um, leadership that we're offered. It's always some kind of ideology versus the other. So you have the blue or the red, or you have this this illusion of choice existing within a predefined paradigm. And most people are happy enough, I think, to go along with that. Although I do think it's changing. So my next question for you, Richard, is: Do you think that there is a schism that's developing um, in the US or in the world at large between, say, what we might term the reality-based community and the faith-based or the assumption-based ideological community? Do you think that there's kind of a divide between them? Well, I think that schism has always been there and it has been somewhat widened by the post-9-11 upgrading of propaganda worldwide, uh, led by America and Britain and uh, a couple other countries that like to buddy up and gang up with them. And uh, so there's this widening gap between reality and what people are being told. But I, th- I just took that as a challenge, and I know you do as a media maker, mm. to say, oh, well, we need to build an ever-expanding bridge to cover that gap no matter how wide it is through time. And it would involve starting at the ground and building our way up in a framework that is both flexible and yet has the tensile strength to send across the 18 wheelers of logic that we need to communicate relevant and factual and actual knowledge to other people so we can survive. So as, 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 as brilliant as they want to be, their actions in the form of taking advantage of other, of other individuals through, for, uh, through violence, uh, fraud, and aggression, like that's always going to be irrational. Mm. They can never win like that battle. They're always going to be immoral. And, you know, people do good and bad things. I'm not saying that the, any of the people involved are like totally evil monsters. And I'm not trying to dehumanize them. Rather, I'm trying to humanize them. I, I, you know, it, you could look at it from the perspective of if any of us had grown up in their specific situation, we would act just like they do. Because we've only been exposed to this little piece and been protected by our, you know, the money or whatever their situation is, right? They've been surrounded by people who, who act and, and they pass these actions on through generations. And, you know, like how, how often do, does Prince Charles or any of those other characters over in Britain, like how often do they assess their situation and say, whoa, from, from where does my divine right come from? Let me see the primary documents and let's really get down to the, the morality and the logic of all this that I have the right to you know, tell all these people and make these, them our subjects and you know, feudalism or people who want to be free you know, in America. Let's, let's fight a war with them because we got our business. You know, what you get down to is it's, if the individuals are inheriting the problems of the earlier generations without analyzing those problems. And so everybody, you know, if you don't think about these things, you're going to find yourself acting out the roles of the institution that you were born in to serve, whether it's, uh, you know, the local 42 electric union or, you know, being a king or queen, king or queen of a country. You're, you're going to serve those institutions uh, like, you know, some people serve them to a more extreme degree than others until they learn to question their way out. And then they say, oh, wait, this is an institution. It seeks to preserve itself just like human beings do. Well, what should we preserve? The human beings or the institutions? What should we preserve? The human beings or the money or the numbers? Mm. Numbers are there to sacrifice, to save human beings. Institutions are there to sacrifice in order to save human beings. Since the, you know, the, the cartel capitalism of the 1900s rolled in, you've got these corporations that have the same rights as human beings, and yet they can be multinational and they can survive you know, uh, denazification because all the German companies got in bed with American and British companies before the war so that no matter who won the war, they could survive. Yeah. And when you learn these things, you're like, wow. You know, when you're serving AIG or one of these big insurance companies, you're serving a company that was started by Cornelius Starr uh, you know, who's part of the OSS and you got these other characters who are all up in CIA business and it's a front company. Oh, 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 wow. Like, what are you serving? And so that's the cost of the money and those bonuses that got handed out during the bailouts for all these financial services companies. I mean, you're talking about all the same companies that facilitated the Nazis. And, and they're more cunning because they're able to fund those people and stand back and they're like, nope, it's the German. It's, it's, it's just Hitler. It's, he's bad. Let's get rid of him, right? When the same people, you know, same dynasties that are doing that here in America, you know, and funding it are the same people that corrupted our education system and brought the Prussian education system, that which led to Nazi Germany. And they seeded it not only through America, but through Japan and almost every other country around the world. 
which is why this is a global phenomenon. It's, it, you know, America epitomizes some of these problems and it's more readily seen because there's a lot more media produced from here. But these are phenomenon uh, that are happening to individuals all over this planet, not just now, but far into the future. And I'm sure we are not the only ones putting question marks up and saying, hey, why? Why? Why am I doing this? Why are we here? What are we doing? How are we doing it? Is it moral? Is you should we, you know, is this how is this the best way we could be spending our time and our, our precious life, which is short for all of us, you know? So it, like if without asking these questions, uh, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not much fun. You're not getting the most out of it. And uh, I think there is some wisdom in saying that uh, you know, examining life is part of living it. Absolutely, and it reminds me a little bit, Richard, of the uh, the game of chess. Essentially, we're the pawns in the game of chess, and you've all the different pieces right up along, and king and queen and whatever else. But there is that hidden hand. There's there's the person who invented the rules somewhere. It's the back, bankers back in the shadows. Exactly. In this case, it's the bankers, and <laughs> they're not on the board. They move the pieces. Money moves the pieces around. That's it. How do you move? How do you put pawns out on the front line? All those guys are hard up for money, mm. right? I mean, when you go through and analyze it. I mean, there's a lot of brilliant history in all the stuff around us. And we just kind of cease to see it because nobody's been pointing us to it. But, you know, just learning the history of the game of chess is a pretty fascinating experience. And if you're interested in that, that could get you reading some more interesting books than, you know, than what you've probably been reading. Yeah, well, I think, I think the chess one is a great... It's one that's... Uh, it's certainly an analogy that's always resonated with me because I think it's more than just an analogy. It's quite literally what is happening. And the rules of chess are applied to the corporate structure that's now controlling this, this world in a despotic way. And the pawns very quickly have to kind of wake up to what's happening. Otherwise, they're going to continue to be moved around and sacrificed. And n- nobody wants that. Really? Well, I think the key to success as a pawn is to get to the other end and transform yourself up the chain intellectually, uh, not in the corporate world, you know, uh, through their hierarchy, but through the hierarchy of learning so that you can actually understand the game at the same level as the people who are playing it against you or better. I mean, you're going to have to be able to, I mean, I just see it as this, that there are people that are taking action against us. It's very much, it's just as serious as stabbing us in the back, only it's slower, it's less obvious. But, the, you know, when you understand the setup here, uh, you know, it's not friendly toward us. Mm. And so the, I just figure if you can learn the nature of the opposition and you can outlearn them by recognizing all the fallacies and frauds and illusions that they've been sucked into and never examined for themselves. Now you've discovered, uh, to use a Star Wars analogy, uh, analogy uh, the exhaust port. And you're like, hey, we got something that can go down that exhaust port mm. and really explode all this irrationality all over the place and everyone can live happily ever after. Now, I'm not naive even think it happens that easy. I am saying that the same mechanisms that they removed from our education to turn our minds off can be replaced and reintegrated by you, the individual, to free your mind and to explore cognitive liberty and to help other people do likewise. So it kind of leads on then, Richard, to the issue of psychopathy. And we will often hear people talk about psychopaths and uh, psycho in the shower and the Alfred Hitchcock Hollywood version of what a psychopath is. But as a lot of us who um, are involved with alchemy here, our regular listeners will know, we, we've quite often spoken about psychopaths and what, what that really means. And I know it's an area of interest to you because you've mentioned even in the interview today, um, sociopaths and psychopaths. Do you think it's the case that one has to be a psychopath or at least predisposed to, uh, to this, this situation where one lacks empathy to rise to the top of the corporate structure that we're talking about? Uh, no, and here's my explanation behind it. <clears throat> uh, if for those not familiar, there was an experiment called the Milgram experiment. Yeah. And I think the person that's the psychopath is the guy in the white coat that keeps telling the innocent, naive person who follows authority to push the button to shock the guy on the other side, eventually to death, according to what the, uh, the person pushing the button believes. Now, it's an experiment, so the guy wasn't really getting shocked, and it was you know, formalized with n- noises and sounds, and at a certain point, the victim would cease to respond, at which point the person pressing the button naively asks the authority, hey, should I, should I, you know, they're not responding, are you sure they're okay? And they're like, please continue the experiment, which means it gives them... Uh, that moral ambiguity so that they can say, well, I'm not taking the action. The authority told me to take the action. And in America in the 1960s, a surprisingly high percentage of people 
acted out the fantasies of psychopaths. So in order to get to the top of the structure, you don't have to be a psychopath. You're going to have to work with psychopaths, and you're going to have to carry out and help them uh, emancipate their, their dreams from their head through your actions, and you're calling that your life. So I'm just saying before you spend more time doing that, take a break. Take a vacation. Think about it. You got a lot of resources. You got a lot of things going for you. You're a smart person, and you could probably think of a way to contribute your, your, your life in such a way that makes you happy as an individual, makes your friends and family proud of you and, and happy that they know you because you're valuable in their life for substantial reasons and helps you in, you know, treat other, you know, other people to the, the time of their lives by helping to catalyze their learning and their inspiration and their creativity so that they can apply themselves at this life in, in this life and not be regretting what they didn't do on their deathbed. Yeah, right. So there's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance that takes place then in order for people to legitimize in their own heads why they will do what they're doing. They'll have to rationalize their actions in some way. So whether it's working with people who they know are not doing good for other people, it's it's about shifting the blame. And again, that term cognitive dissonance, I think that's that's rife and rampant, certainly in the Western world at the moment. Well, I think also calling back to, the, to Mark Passio's body of work, to outsource your ability to think and to be conscious and, and to carry these ideas with you that are not factual and actual and espouse them as real is not only immoral, it's evil. And so we know we're all good people, in my opinion. We're all good people and we're just you know taking stupid actions because we haven't thought it through. I mean, there's a very small number of psychopaths out there, people who just want to be that way, not because of biology or anything else. They just like to hurt other people. They like to steal. They get off on it. They get a thrill. They get a rise from it. You know, whatever biological reason you want to give, you know, endorphins in the system, you know, cortisone, cortisol, whatever, mm. they are thriving off of it. And that's, you know, a form of sickness. We should not openly tolerate that when it comes to the cost of our lives and the lives of our friends and family. So I just think that, you know, when you analyze the situation, it's like there's so much potential here, which is why I'm willing to devote so much of my time and life to this endeavor because the, the potential's here. We just need to apply the work and the diligent, persistent effort to continue churning it out in various forms until we create the pieces of media that provide the, the audience with all the same things that they get from the BBC or NBC or CBS or CNN or Fox News or any of these places, because it is of such a high quality and stature, it might even outshine what, what they're taking and say, hey, this is better than what I had before. This is actually more substantial, more rewarding, has less commercials. I can actually focus on it. It wears and is durable over time, meaning that 10 years from now, that's a solid component that you didn't have to go back and unlearn or relearn or learn your way around it because you did actual learning. Questions were asked, substantial and reasonable answers were found, they were composited into some sort of composition of media form, and it's out there, and it can be shared, and it doesn't cost anything to share it with people. It's like, that's the great thing about knowledge and wisdom, is you can share it with people unlimited. That's what media is all about, is taking these, these tidbits of reality and these pieces of truth and trying to organize them in such a way that people can integrate them and make them useful in their lives. And I think that's the least psychopathic thing that we can do i agree and i like what you say about rewarding because on my own journey i suppose my journey of unlearning and then relearning the the big revelation for me was um the, the difference between the way i was taught in school where everything was so passive it was about right listen to what the teacher is telling you and then regurgitate it onto a page and you'll be rewarded through marks or grades or whatever it might be whereas when I decided to try and unlearn and relearn, I'm fully involved in the process because I'm doing it for myself and be it through Alchemy Radio or be it through my own research or reading or whatever else it might be. I, I, I'm in control of what's happening and the information that resonates with me or that feels right or when I uh, critically examine the evidence, I can dispose of it or I can take it on board, but I don't have to believe in it. And I think that's that's the big difference for a lot of people when when we have to assume that somebody else is telling us that something is right or we have to rely on a belief system of sorts, that's when we're in a little bit of trouble and that's when we can end up in uh, in deep water out of our depth. Whereas the process for me, it's it's just, it's almost like the bodybuilder who goes into the gym and he, 
<laughs> I'm talking about myself here, skinny for years and years and years. And over time, gradually, when you put in the work and you do it for yourself, you see the rewards. And now I'm far from, uh, far from the bodybuilder still. I'm still that skinny guy. But I can see the difference that it's made to me whether it's in the gym or whether it's when I'm doing my research or whatever it is, it all works together. And there's a kind of a, there, there's a synergy that happens. There's a synchronicity. And I think we mentioned money being an attractive force. I think positivity is also an attractive force. And if we do embrace and take, take back our power and control our learning or control our physical activity or control our entertainment, whatever it is, as long as we're in control of it and not allowing others to control it, I think that's where the rewards really come in and that's where life becomes fun or certainly it has for me anyway. Have you kind of had any similar experience on your journey, Richard? Well, I can say that they use fear to control people because you have fears when you're out of control. Yeah. And so if you can use learning as a process to meet the unknown and to meet the confusion of life that we're going to encounter every day, you can't know everything at any given time. So you got to use this process of learning all the time to stay on point, to, to be serene in what you're doing and actually be conscious and present and I, I you know if i have any one belief it would be this belief is a rest stop on the destination to knowledge so don't take the rest stop as the destination get up take action if you're going to be positive minded i advocate that only when you're being active because positive thoughts without action is a it's that's that's a recipe for destruction you need the other element which is constructive action and so this comes back to the idea of cogent knowledge. If you're trying to communicate beliefs, well, that's like, you know, that's not very useful to other people who are looking for knowledge. When you have cogent knowledge, that is useful. That's the transaction everyone's looking for. They don't want to know what was in your dream last night because it doesn't pertain to them in their life. But objective reality, truth and facts of the matter that actually pertain to cause and effect and that which exists oh, well, that's super useful. And if you can organize that into some form of understanding, maybe you know, in the form of uh, a piece of media or spoken through the active literacies, uh, then, then that's a recipe for resurrecting all the common sense that we need to escape despotism and, and turn that way back down and let's turn liberty back up. But I think some of the ideas that uh, originally brought about America never really got to permeate the rest of the world and by the time the American brand is out there colonizing the world on, on Britain's behalf through the Anglo-American establishment in the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes, then it, you know, a, a very different uh, marketing uh, idea is communicated, that of domination through uh, hubris and hegemony. I think you're dead right. And Cecil Rhodes is actually a very interesting character for anybody who might like to start research and study because so much centers around him. He's almost like a fulcrum for a lot of what we can see now and the processes that took place to get us from there to here. Um, he, certainly he's somebody who I, I would have looked at in depth over the past year. And the more I read about and learn about Cecil Rhodes, the the more I can see the ties and the pieces coming together. I think he's just a very, a very, very interesting character and somebody who was a facilitator for the powers that be or the control system. And uh, I think we've... Uh, we're, well, I think he's just like, he's a lot like Machiavelli insofar as wanting to ingratiate himself to the establishment. And he was financially backed by the Rothschild banking family, which had control over everything on the European continent, including Britain at that time. And, you know, the, the, the financing that comes out of there funds the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company. You know, so all these different corporate entities come out of this overarching uh, way to stabilize and to manipulate other nations, uh, that being international commerce, with which the Rothschilds are, you know, the kings of. They invented it. So what you have is uh, Cecil Rhodes going off, you know, this is, if you've never heard of Cecil Rhodes before, this might be interesting. So I just wanted to lay it out there for your audience very quickly. Yep. Cecil Rhodes goes off to Africa after graduating from Oxford. He creates De Beers Diamonds. Uh, you know, it's a mining company that he conglomerates or amalgamates out of these other uh, smaller businesses that he conquers because he has unlimited funding, basically. Uh, De Beers to this day operates as a cartel that is not allowed to operate in the United States. And the, um, but uh, De Beers' marketing has fully permeated the United States and the entire world because everyone knows diamonds are forever, diamonds are a girl's best friend, diamonds are for engagement rings. All these trends were brought into uh, being during the 20th century artificially 
through public relations, uh, through people like Edward Bernays and, and many other uh, clever uh, rhetoricians. Uh, also, the British royal family put away all their other uh, types of jewels and uh, specifically came out wearing diamonds to help promote the diamond trend in the four, I think it was in the late 30s when they did that. But these are interesting parts of history that you can pick up. Uh, by reading uh, some of the diamond books by Edward Epstein, or uh, you know, there's another one called Glitter and Greed mm -hmm. uh, by Janine Roberts. These are very uh, cogent, uh, you know, sources that pick up on the Cecil Rhodes legacy, but they don't really treat it in its full manner. They mention the involvement, and uh, Epstein himself went down to stay at De Beers and you know knows the whole legacy. But it wasn't until I encountered a book called Tragedy and Hope: A History of the World in Our Time by Carol Quigley. Mm. Uh, a book which was so influential in my life in its truth-telling that I named our production company after it. Uh, in this book, it details the last will and testament of Cecil John Rhodes and his specific creation of two aspects in his last will and testament, uh, that being the Rhodes Scholars, specifically to colonize the thought and thinking of the major intellectual leaders around the world, specifically in American education, to make it more like the, the British line of thinking of empire and domination and not liberty and freedom. And then the other being the creation of a secret society, specifically, he uses the words secret society, that was based on the, on the, uh, the constitutions of the Jesuits, the inner workings, the, the structure of the Jesuits, because the word constitution can have many words, uh, you know, many different meanings. Um, and these ideas were, were carried forward and carried out by the Rhodes Scholars and a group called the Roundtable, which is a group of very influential uh, international uh, banking and, and lawyer you know, type interests uh, who were manipulating international law, international commerce, and could have a great shaping effect on America from behind the scenes uh, using, for instance, uh, tax-free foundations for the Rockefeller, the Carnegie Foundations to change the attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs of Americans through the educational and political mechanisms. So I was like, tragedy and hope. This book is a keystone. It's the, it's the cornerstone, whatever, you, whatever metaphor you want to use for important and tying things together. It's, you know, and, and reading it is like cutting through the Gordian knot, to use a, another metaphor. I like to use metaphors because they help people illustrate things in their minds and helps to explain things. So uh, I'm not trying to lie by using metaphors. I'm trying to throw these interesting ideas out there to help you unpack the knowledge. But what's in Tragedy and Hope is a straightforward education that any high school or college should be providing individuals with if you speak English. If you speak English, you have to read this book, and it's an arduous book, and I'm sorry to say that it's a very long book. I could point you to the specific pages that you would want to read to gain a cogent understanding without having to read the whole book, but you know, there's many other sources out there that I could provide that are more succinct but less well-known, mm -hmm. uh, equally as valid and reputable. But again, we're not being pointed toward these books or these authors, but Quigley was not alone. He was not the first to put this together. He just happened to have the first substantial book that was presented to me uh, through my research. And Quigley taught at, you know, he was educated at Harvard and Princeton. He taught at Harvard, Princeton, and Georgetown. He educated Rhodes Scholars like Bill Clinton. So here was a guy from the establishment telling me, Directly, is like, here it is. He spent 20 years going through their records and working with the Council on Foreign Relations and these other entities that were created out of the last will and testament of Cecil John Rhodes. So as an American, it was very important to me to learn about the root causes of what was destroying. Not, I don't consider it my country. I just live here. I live here with a bunch of cool people that I feel are being taken advantage of. And I see that being replicated as a model for the future all over the world. Mm. So, I don't know. I get frustrated sometimes, but um, I don't lose hope. I'm an optimist. I see, I, see the, I see that the reality is there, and we have words and all these great tools, and every day that we keep learning and expanding our ability to communicate with people, you know, I, I see the hope become reality through the actions. Well, there you have this tragedy and hope. And I suppose if we were to round things off, Richard, by... You giving, now this is kind of putting you on the spot and maybe there isn't a short uh, Vox Pop style answer to it, but if you were to give one piece of advice to the person who has listened to us today and this is all completely new information to them and they're interested in it but not really sure how to begin their own quest or their own journey, what, what little piece of advice would it be to read a particular book or would it to be, be to, to open themselves up to a particular type of media or what, what would you say to them? The key to life is learning how to learn anything for yourself 
because that will empower you to find your bliss and explore it and to find serenity and to have quality, meaningful, substantial relationships in all aspects of your life, whether it be personal or work. And uh, to exemplify that in a succinct uh, media format, I would recommend uh, Googling or using a, some sort of uh, some, some sort of start engine, you know, start page uh, search engine out there that doesn't collect your data. I have a habit of saying Google, but I don't mean Google. I mean stay away from them. Uh, the The piece of media is Peace Revolution episode twenty three. It's Peace Revolution episode twenty three: How to Free Your Mind, the Occulted or Hidden Tools of Wisdom. So in that one conversation, I alert you to many different uh, levels of a specific methodology that can be used and applied every day, you know, in all areas of your life, every day of your life. And the more you use it, uh, it will become a habit to ask these questions, to gain this knowledge before you take action. And since our life is a series of consequences to our actions, uh, I found that once you start making more informed decisions with a higher degree of certainty, the effects become readily evident and they are pleasing and uh, fruitful effects that continue to bear fruit. Fantastic. Well, remind us of the websites and the various media portals where you can be reached, Richard. You know, I have a Podomatic page for Peace Revolution. I find it's, it, it loads a little bit slow. So if you, want, if you don't mind that, if you have a quick connection, it's peacerevolution.org. And if not, if you have a slow connection, all of our media is found at tragedyandhope.com. There you can screen our films, uh, our shorter videos, our podcasts. And we also have an online learning community. And everything we do uh, that we provide for free to an uh, audience around the world uh, is 100% funded by subscribers of the Tragedy and Hope online community. So we get our funding just like you do directly from the individuals who are consuming our content and appreciate it and find value in it. And that helps us share the, the wisdom as far and wide as we can in as short a period of time as possible. I have the power, you have the power, we have the power. Richard Grove, it's been a pleasure, indeed a privilege, to speak to you today on Alchemy Radio. I hope you'll come back to us again because there's so much we can talk about in the future and hopefully you've, you've enjoyed our chat today. John, I would enjoy that and thank you to you and your brother for doing what you do and making this possible and giving people a respite from the cartel corporate media with all those commercials and all that uh, dumbing down content. Thank you for uh, tuning in and not dropping out. Alchemy Radio.